This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon to share some of the recent research that my group here at Stanford has been conducting on neural prostheses. And the neural prosthetic concept is really to either write information into the brain and the nervous system or read information out of the brain and the nervous system. And all of this is to help address a broad range of neurological diseases and injuries. And I'll briefly touch upon these wonderful systems that are able to deliver information into the brain and the nervous system, but I'll primarily focus on this emerging new class of prosthesis that aims to read information out of the brain to help some of the most severely paralyzed patients. Now the problem is as simple as the fact that millions of people are unable to move or to communicate. And the problem is also as personal as this photo of Christopher Reeve. And as many of you may know, in 1995, he was thrown from his horse, severed his spinal cord, broke his neck, and from that day forward, he was unable to walk, unable to move his arms, unable to uh, breathe on his own, or unable to uh, even communicate very well due to the respirator that's needed. And other patients suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease and so forth are not even able to speak at all and are not able to perhaps even blink their eyes to communicate. Now we aim to try to help provide new treatment options for these most severely disabled patients with it also being in mind that we could help less disabled people, still severely disabled, for example, with an arm amputation, but perhaps less so. And one important point here I think is important to make is that Christopher Reeve, all the way up until his death in 2004, is a person of considerable means. He had the world's best health care. He had the world's best research. And he had a foundation that's supported even our own research going full blast to try to remediate this. Still, his suffering was so great, and he died without a cure. Now, how might we be able to offer some uh, quality of life improvement for these patients? So what's shown here is the potential solution to potentially read out neural signals directly from the brain and use those signals after some interpretation or decrypting, if you will, to drive prosthetic arms or computer cursors on a screen. We look out, we see where we would like to go, we know where our arm is at, we take that information in through the rear part of the brain, labeled visual, we then start forming initial plans to move our arms, we elaborate those plans, and then those plans and uh, commands descend down the spinal cord to drive the muscles in our arm to guide the arm to where we'd like it to go. Now, if the spinal cord is injured, for example, what we propose to do is to tap into the electrical signals associated with individual neurons, interpret those neural signals with mathematical algorithms as run on custom designed chips. Those of you that are in and around Silicon Valley are very familiar with this technology that fuels everything that we're running around here today. And then deliver those computer signals either to guide a computer cursor on a screen or onto a robotic arm uh, to move the arm or perhaps even muscle stimulators to reanimate the paralyzed arm. The simplest way to express this proposal in a block diagram is that we take sensory information into the brain, the brain does some processing and then it's shipped onto the motor output stages. And if it's that last link that's broken, we might be able to build effectively a bypass. The way we'd like to do that is to tap in to a region of the brain called the premotor cortex or the motor cortex that's involved in planning and executing arm movements. So every time you move your arm, that area of the brain where the green, light start, or green line starts becomes active in a very particular way that I'll tell you more about in just a second. Take those neural signals out, and if you're looking at a keyboard, we can predict in real time, very rapidly, in fact, beat your own single finger typing speed, exactly the letters you would like to type and hit, and therefore provide a communication mechanism that Christopher Reeve or those similar to him could benefit from. Now, how do we do that? We begin by doing a neurosurgical procedure to implant a silicon-based electrode array that you're seeing on the right. And to give you size perspective, that's about the size of my pinky fingernail, four millimeters on a side. The 100 tiny electrodes are only one millimeter long, 
that penetrate just the most outer layers of the outer region of your brain called the cerebral cortex. Now, each one of those electrodes allows us to measure, if we plot voltage versus time, this signal coming from the tip of that electrode. Okay? And this is exactly what a neurosurgeon will do all over before going in and resecting a tumor, for example, if you have that in the brain, to know what the different areas of the brain do. Now, the trace, you'll notice, on the left side has very few of these very sharp deflections. And on the right, you notice that there are many of those sharp deflections. And it turns out that simply by counting the number of those spikes that occur in some period of time, we can interpret what those neurons are saying. And let me play for you uh, what this neural recording sounds like. And you'll hear a quiet period and then a louder period, a quiet period, then a louder period. And this is happening while making arm movements to the left and to the right. Loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft. So it's a very faint whisper, and more on that in a second, by which I mean that one electrode, one set of neurons, is a very important piece of the puzzle, but not all that you need. So what we were hearing were quiet, periods of quietness and periods of a lot of action potentials. And it turns out that when it was quiet, the arm was moving to the left. And when it was louder, the arm was moving to the right. Now, because it's so important to understand how the neurons represent this information, let me go into a little bit more detail. Okay? This slide and the next will effectively teach you how to design a neural prosthesis. I don't <laughs> recommend that you do this in your garage at home tonight, but, but you could. So we work with rhesus monkeys for two reasons. One, we can train them to perform these elaborate eye and arm movement tasks, as you're seeing here, and I'll describe. Second, we take it very seriously that we need to translate the work we do to humans. Their brains are so close to humans that what we learn in these monkeys directly moves to humans, and that is our ongoing goal. We train monkeys to look and touch a point of light on a screen, much like you might do on a video game. A point comes on, for example, here, shown down, but it could come on anywhere on the screen. And at that moment, the monkey starts planning to reach that location because he knows, after some period of time, a second or two, the center lights will turn off, telling him to reach to that location to get a drop of juice as a reward. Now, what we do is we record the number of those action potentials emitted in some period of time and plot them on the graph below. So when he was reaching down, you can see when he's reaching down to the right, for example, it, uh, the yellow circle appears in a band of green. The green is keyed to 40 spikes per second. We may have heard 40 of those spikes per second. Now when he reaches up and to the right, more towards the heart of that red zone, we may hear 100 spikes per second. And we proceed over a period of five or 10 minutes to have him make all these arm movements, plan and reach, plan and reach, plan and reach. And we can map out this color map. Now we can play a little game. To the monkey, we show him the spots. To us, we would put up keys on a keyboard. Keys are just targets at spatial locations. So if we heard 100 spikes per second and I ask you where was he planning to reach, you would say E key. It's the only region that corresponds to 100 spikes per second. But now what if we heard 40 spikes per second? Now where does he want to reach? Where would we as a human be wanting to strike the key? We don't know. G, A, B, C, D. There's an ambiguity. There's an ambiguity because the neuron's responding in the same way. And this makes the point that one neuron, as shown here, is very important. It's like one piece of a jigsaw puzzle but it doesn't tell us the whole story. To get to the whole story, we have to record from hundreds of neurons, and we can do that with the electrode array I previously showed you, where each electrode records from one or more neurons. That would produce a response pattern like this, where each square corresponds to how any one neuron responds. And if we actually saw this, we'd still be in trouble. It's like having 100 of the same jigsaw puzzle piece. It doesn't really help us. Fortunately. The brain isn't organized that way. Instead, what we see is a different pattern from every neuron. So we can play a final little game here by thinking about having somebody sitting in a room planning to reach up and to the left. What we would have come to us 
is the, according, uh, is the corresponding response from every neuron. For example, in the upper left neuron, we'd see green through the little hole. A couple over, you'd see red, and so forth. And what you get at the end of the day is a color piece corresponding to the responses from all those neurons that uniquely tells us that the patient wants to reach over to the left and up. And we can do that by intersecting our observation with the database of knowledge that we've acquired, the whole color map, so as to predict that location. Now, what I'd love to do is take you all over to the lab and show you how this works. Instead, what we'll do is we'll again play a little game. We will forego the brief neurosurgery, okay? <laughs> We put it all to the test in our lab, and this is what we'll be doing. So our monkeys look and touch. We may turn on a target. We record from a whole array. We uh, receive the electrical signals from each tip. We tell which neuron we're listening to. We get that color piece. And then we uh, predict which target he wants to go to. And he gets a drop of juice and a cursor around that target to tell him he did it correctly. The game we'll play, unfortunately, doesn't involve any juice. Uh, so if you sit in your chairs and look at this keyboard and relax your muscles and imagine moving your right arm up and hitting the S key. And I could go record from right about here on the left side of your brain, right in premotor cortex, and predict exactly that key. And I could do that very fast. And once I do that, I can move the S up there, and we could keep doing it T, A, in, and I think you see where this is going. <laughs> Would I dare spell Berkeley? No. OK. And all of a sudden, what we've just done here is we've just mimicked what it's like to think about making a movement, have it read out, predicting locations, and type, typing out a message, which could provide a communication channel to a physician or loved ones if you're severely communication disabled. And right before the last slide, what does this look like in the lab? What we've been able to achieve is a system that performs about 15 words per minute of throughput. You could sit here and type about 15 words per minute. The typing that's coming up here is going at that rate. Being Stanford alumni, of course, the first thing you would type if you had such a thing would be Shakespeare. So <laughs> we've matched to that. And two observations. First of all, this is much faster by a factor of about four than anything that's been done previously. And this has been very encouraging to see that we can design these systems much more quickly that may offer real benefit to patients to offset that surgical risk. The second thing is it's still not lightning fast. You could certainly beat this with 10 finger typing, but maybe it's on par with one finger. We believe that uh, there's a lot more progress that can be made. We can go up to much, much faster rates. So in conclusion, we certainly hope that the title of Christopher Reeve's uh, second book uh, is actually possible, that there is nothing impossible. We can provide some new hope for these patients. We're encouraged not only by the performance results that I just showed you, but also as shown on the right here, uh, as recently as last uh, month with our wonderful collaborators at Utah, in producing not only the electrode array that you see at the bottom next to the penny, but also on top of it, custom designed chips that are very low power as, long, as well as little electrical coils that allow us to implant all of that, again, the size of your pinky fingernail, all within the skin so that you can just telemeter out information to drive, for example, a replacement arm or a computer screen. Thank you.